Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Dr. Emerson, welcome to Stall Side. Thank you. Yeah, Happy thanks for here. thanks for joining us. Yeah, really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Excited. So, Rolf, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, we'll uh, we'll see how far we need to go back here. But um, I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is actually where the the Pfizer vaccine is made. Right, I think that's the headquarters now for that. In fact, that company used to be Upjohn, and perhaps this is what happened to me early in my career. I could remember walking across a field behind our house to some eight foot fences that you shouldn't have climbed, but we did, <laughs> and we found some ponds back there from from up john on their property that were not a normal blue color right so i didn't realize i mean at the time you don't think about it as a kid you know you're playing back there and so perhaps that's that's what's happened to me <laughs> yeah. along the way so, so but you, that, sw- you swam in the ponds yeah it? i didn't actually get yeah. in them no, okay. okay but um you did eat the three-eyed fish that you yeah, caught in there <laughs> exactly <laughs> But that, that company actually became Pfizer, you know, eventually. So that's where I grew up, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's a good place to grow up. And, and from there, um, actually, I, I knew I was going to try to go to veterinary school, but I went to Michigan State undergrad. Um, took me three tries to get into veterinary school. So this should be um, a good way for, if anybody young is listening to this, just keep trying. Yeah, just keep trying to wear them down. Eventually, you might get where you want to get to. <laughs> um, so, so did you grow up roping, riding, doing all that stuff? No, what, what made you want to be I, a veterinarian? I, actually, it was a, interestingly my biology teacher, and it just he made that a very interesting class, and it it just seemed interesting. You know, my major was zoology. Um, I was not around horses until I went to veterinary school. So that came late. I mean, I thought, you know, when I was going through undergrad, I, I thought they were very, you know, beautiful animals and athletes and whatnot, you know. But um, I didn't grow up with them, you know. So I was going to plumb dogs and cats in northern Michigan when I started veterinary school. Gotcha. So um, the, the horse thing, it, quite honestly, I mean, I, I was interested in them as athletes anyway, but... Um, I ran into a woman in my class who uh, actually helped me get through. Like I, I was a connoisseur of people's notes because I didn't <laughs> make the, all the <laughs> all of the classes, you know. Um, and at that time, people didn't print notes. You, you didn't have a printed note for you, you know. So you had to take your own notes. And if you're not there, it's hard to take your own notes. Um, she took the best notes. Um, and you took the best notes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was probably second or third in the class. You know, I was in the half that made the top half possible, you know. Um, so anyway, and she was very interested in horses. And I, I think the first time we went out on a date, we went to some county fair to see draft horses or something. I, I can't remember for sure. Um and so I became more and more interested. And, and then I realized that actually it was more fun to be in the large animal clinic than in the small animal clinic. And I just got more and more interested in it and just kind of grew from there. And somebody, actually one of the small animal surgeons, you know how different people make different um, impressions on your life, right? And there was a small animal surgeon there that, that, uh, took a liking to me and let me do a fair amount in small animal surgery. And he said, you know, you get a little knack for this. Maybe I ought to pursue that. And so I was interested in surgery and became interested in horses. Um, and so there's, you know, another guy there, in a, you know, it said, you need to try to do an internship this, you know, when you leave. And he was able to hook me up with um, a guy named Joe Ferner in Chicago who had a practice uh, it was Ferner and Phillips at the time. And, you know, I didn't know anything about boarded surgeons or whatever, but he was a boarded surgeon, and um, he had done his residency at Penn, and the guy at Michigan State had done his residency at Penn. So, you know, it's they all kind of knew each other. And so I thought I'd try that for a year and see how it went. And it, that was a, actually a very eye-opening year. I learned so much about horses that year. You know, I lived above the clinic. 
you know, you know watered horses every night, 10 o'clock, did all the treatments at night. I was the only intern in the clinic. Um, it was great. I mean, was, I mean, I worked my butt off, but it was a great experience for me. And I, I learned a lot about, you know, working on horses by yourself, especially foals. Um, the, it, it was good. And, and so then I thought, well, and this girl that I started going out with, you know, she was back in Michigan at the time. Um, and she was interested in ophthalmology. And so she knew that she was going to pursue an ophthalmology residency. And I thought, well, yeah, I, I thought I said, try this horse surgery stuff, you know. So I <laughs> applied. And, of course, you know, there were a couple of inter- universities at that time. It was, there was not a matching program, right? They, they, you know, you applied. And if you had good enough references and all that, you know, that's how you got into some of those places. And there are actually a couple of schools that flew her to interview for a residency and the residencies were going to be decided on this one Monday. I, she decided she thought she was going to go to Tennessee. So I, I hadn't, I didn't get any calls obviously. And so I thought I was going to work on meals in Tennessee for <laughs> three years while she was doing her <laughs> residency. And then the next thing you know, I had some guy named Bob Schneider called me on a Friday before, you know, they decided. And, Asked if I was interested and told him ab- absolutely I was interested. And next thing you know, on Monday, uh, actually, my, you know, this woman ends up being my wife, right? Mm-hmm. So um, she took a residency at Ohio State first thing in the morning. You know, if they usually call you if they really want you bad eight o'clock in the morning, right? So she knew she was going to Ohio State. I'm waiting until the afternoon <laughs> to get a call. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up going to Florida. So anyway, it's, you know, the, the networking is, is huge. And that's where I ended up where I am now, you know, because of all this networking. So I ended up down in Florida. Um, at that time, I was really getting interested in orthopedics also. And I, I'd love doing colic surgery and... and they let me do a lot more at Florida than they probably should have uh, at the time. But, you know, I, I learned an awful lot there as I did in my internship. And um, so talking to Schneider, as you know, I heard about this guy reading about it in Blood Horse. By this time, I was getting Blood Horse every week and reading that also. There's this guy up at Ohio State named Larry Brownwich who had developed some technique for arthroducing a fetlock and I was reading about this one of the first ones he had done up there and and uh so I was asking Bob if he knew this guy and I said that's what I wanted to do and that's what I told him and he said yeah I, I know him so the next thing I do he he's got me lined up to go to Ohio State for a month to work at Ohio State which turned out to be great I mean I didn't realize it at the time but Schneider and Brown, which are their residencies together. I mean, they were good friends. So, um, and that opened the door at Ohio State. So after two years of residency at Florida, um, I decided that I'd, I'd learned as much as I could at Florida and I needed to move on. And I tried, the guy who was head of uh, surgery at Ohio State at the time, a guy named Al Gobble, and anybody who's been around Ohio State for a while have heard you know, Gobble stories. Um, but I was on the phone with them and, and asking them if is there any way they had a third year residency, you know, and he says, no, we, we don't. And I said, well, I think I'm going to leave Florida. I'm not exactly sure what to do. And I, I never forget this conversation. He says, Emberton, take that job at Florida. I said, you don't take that. You're going to be picking oranges down there for the next couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the next day he calls me back. And says, um, actually, we do have a spot for you because Brownwood is going to leave for a year. Or there he's leaving. He, w- he went to practice in New Jersey. And so that opened up the door for me to go to Ohio State. So I went there as a third-year resident. Um, but, but Claire was still there, right? This, this, this was not all purely academic. True. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'd been up there to visit a couple times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a bit light on the details here. Yeah, also. right, 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 right. But we understand why. You, you were asking about my career, not my personal yeah, That's life. exactly <laughs> right. Bad man, Bart, bad man. Um, yeah, so that's, that was obviously there's a couple things attracting me to Ohio State. But 
and so I, that worked out for a year and it, it was great i'm uh, the other resident and i uh, and the th- other third year resident and i did all the the colic surgeries that year and it worked out well and but the problem at the end of that year is that Bramlage decided to come back and that I, I mean i had to leave you know there wasn't a job for me there so at that point um it, you know it's always good to be either married to or hooked up with someone who is better than you at something and other people would like them to work for them so it it was it just didn't seem like it's a huge problem for us to find a job together for her to do ophthalmology and me to do surgery and we ended up going to new hampshire for a year in private practice and i knew fairly soon that that wasn't that wasn't going to work out long term um and the the interesting thing that happened is that uh, at ohio state you know brownwich and gobble and a guy named jimmy robertson decided they needed another person on the faculty that could do both orthopedics and soft tissue and so they created a position there and the guy who had taught claire ophthalmology they bumped him up to be assistant dean to make room for her so it's it's, it's great i mean ohio state was a happening place at that time and i mean what an opportunity you know so we went there and um Actually, we were there for about two years, something like that. And the, the second year I was there, um, Rude and Riddle were trying to entice Bramwich to go down to Lexington to work at this hospital. And, and Larry had helped him design the surgery part of the hospital. And he eventually turned him down at the time, and he ended up giving him my name. And interestingly, at that time, you know, Claire was pregnant, um, and we were considering our options of having two clinicians in the in in a clinical faculty at the same time at Ohio State and that with kids and that I don't think that had happened yet but uh, that had happened at Michigan State and so Michigan State was interested mostly in an ophthalmologist but they also needed a surgeon so we interviewed there and we're going to take the job at Michigan State and probably two days before I was going to call them and tell them we'll take that job some guy named Tom Riddle calls and asks if I'm interested in interviewing here, and which we did. And you know, you guys work here. Yeah. <laughs> Just look around. Yeah. There's a lot of horses. Yeah. And if you like doing surgery, and I, I knew that you know this is just a small place at the time, but they were building a nice hospital, and it just seemed like an opportunity. And I was 31 and naive. You know, you ready to just take some risks. So. Um, it worked out. So, so you'd never met either one of them before that time? No. You just called them? Yeah. No, never met them. Came down and interviewed, and it just seemed like uh, it'd be something that we were interested in. So, so how, many, great. how many veterinarians did they have at that time? They had Rude Riddle, um, a guy named Larry Olson, a guy named Scott Pierce. Um, that was it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> And Larry left eventually. Obviously, Scott Pierce stayed. Um, they had already, I guess, hired someone to do neonates. Um, and they had already planned on hiring someone to run the lab who was still with us. Um, so when, when we opened, so we, and they wanted me to come down in the fall, but I was going to sit the surgery boards that year, and I wanted to sit them out of Ohio State because I was studying with some different people. Um, so we moved down here about a week after I sat the surgery boards, and it just started in, and hadn't, haven't stopped. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Actually, Claire was pregnant at the time, so she foaled about a month after we got here. Um, had you know had two two kids while we were here, um, and it's, it's just taken off. I mean, it, it you know the. It's the really important thing is surrounding yourself with good people. And we were able to, I mean, I was fortunate that they hired me. Um, the, you know, Tom and Bill, Rudin and Riddle, were great to work with and for. Um, you know, Pierce is a great guy to work with. Um, and from there, we were able to continue to hire people that um, contributed and were good at what they did and we're good people. 
So okay. when I when I first started, you know, I, Scott Alsher is one of our one of our partners, and he described it to me this way when I first started. He said, you know, so we've got lots of personalities. He said we've got Bill Rude who's a personality, Tom Riddle who's a very hard worker has a great name, and you've got Bramless who's got a ton of talent. He said, but Rolf Emerson is is the glue that holds all this together. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a very good description, and I've always kept that in mm -hmm. mind since then. And how have you navigated that with the personalities, the egos, with the changes in veterinary medicine to, to, to help to, to mold Root and Riddle to what yeah. it is today? Actually, if you look around, every, I mean, all the people that are working here are somewhat humble. You know, I, actually, I learned that early on. The, you want to hire, I mean, you got to hire intelligent people and people are good at what they do but what you're after is hiring personalities and you can teach them the job but you can't teach personalities i don't think once you're past veterinary school I mean, you 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 pretty much are what you are you know so that i mean that that, that makes a huge difference on who you hire um and then just i mean you, when you're working with people every day you need to get along with them I mean, you should treat people the way you'd like to be treated. And yeah. But I think we actually were able to manage to hire the right people. And there's a few people that have been here and have left. That, that's true. But um, that, that's just been so key. And, you know, both Bill and Tom have been very good about, you know, discussing the people are going to hire. And, and we, we've all contributed um, as we've gone through the years, I mean, all the partners now are contributing to who are the next people that are coming along, you know. So, I, I mean, it's, yep. it's nice that Scott said that about me, but, I, you know, it's been everybody, you know. It's been everybody contributing. One, one of the things that, that I think will be your legacy is how many people you've trained that, uh, that have mm. come, come through here. And one of the fun things that we do when we get together at the AP or mm -hmm. wherever, um, you're the only guy that I know that can the name everybody and the year that they were here with an internship talk about the internship program the residency some of the training programs that we do and and how much they mean to to you into the industry yeah i actually I, I can't do that anymore you know so you know we've got i did the figures for this last intern class um we've we now have probably about 350 not quite but around there interns that have come through our program whether hospital or ambulatory, and about 100 of those are ambulatory, 250 are hospital. There's actually like 15 or so that have done both, ambulatory and hospital internships. Um, that, I mean, we started real small. We just had one to start with, and it, just, and it grew from there. But, but actually, that is a huge perk to my job, is to watch some of these young people go through their careers and see where they get to. And, you know, you, you want people that you train to become better than you are. I mean, you, that's your hope for them. And there are a lot of people that are. You know, they, they've gone on. They're either major players at universities or in large equine practices. And we have people in industry now. Um, there's people in Europe and Australia and New Zealand. There's a, there, actually, we've, if you think about it, we've had a tremendous influence on equine veterinary medicine over the years. You know, there's over 110 people, not that, that that's the important part, but there's over 110 interns, previous interns that are board certified in something. Mm. You know, most of them surgery, but medicine, radiology, anesthesia, ophthalmology, sports medicine. Dentistry. Dentistry, yeah. toxicology. I mean, mm. it's a pretty broad, um, base of, of the people that have been through here. And the other thing that's really nice is that you can call many of those old interns up and tell them that there's someone to come visit their university or, or the practice they're at, and, th and they'll help that person out if they're an intern from Root and Riddle now. You know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great network of, of people that, that have gone through here and, and have done extremely well. And it's nice to watch really is so well one of the things i, I was Im, i'm impressed too that you don't just know their names what year they were here you, most of the time you know who they're married to and about their kids yeah. and and there's some, some real caring um that goes into that so 
It's appreciated. So t- talk about your areas of interest. What, uh, what, what kind of surgery do you like to do? You know, it, it obviously is modified. So as I told you before, I started out, I was going to be the best orthopod, period. But then, you know, after being here for three and a half, or actually four, I counted by breeding season or foaling season. So mm-hmm. I was here for four foaling seasons by myself as a surgeon. And I cried uncle. And I, I just, I couldn't keep doing it. You know, you're on emergency all the time. And so we were able to hire uh, Brownwich at that time. So guess what happened to my orthopedic caseload? <laughs> you know it, it dwindled a little bit but, but the other thing is that you know when i first came here that wasn't the major caseload the major caseload was emergencies mm-hmm. emergency surgery kind of stuff um colics some wounds uh we started doing the dystocia thing which is we've, we've really kind of pushed that along over the years um so my interests have had to change a little bit and the one thing that was going on at Ohio State um, when I left there is that the, you know, some people did orthopedics, and some people did soft tissue, and they were both um, encouraged to continue pursuing that in depth. And so, if if you are allowed to focus on something, you tend, you should get better at it. I mean, if you don't, you probably should do something else. But the so we, we kind of incorporated that same thing here, you know, in, in the surgery field. I and mean, when Larry came, he, he, you knew he was going to be doing mostly orthopedics. He did do emergency duty. He did some dystocias and colics early on. But um, and it kind of pushed me, excuse me, pushed me a little bit more towards um, the soft tissue stuff. Yeah. Which is fine. I mean, I enjoyed doing. I, I actually I like doing surgery. Period. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, that's the direction I kind of started going. And you know, interestingly, now you know this. I mean, I'd probably do more orthopedics than I do soft tissue with all the arthroscopy and transfacial screws and that kind of thing. But um, really, my focus. And if you had to ask anybody, well, you know, what, what's Emerson do? And I'm sure they'd tell you soft tissue surgery. So the, I, mean, I like doing colic surgery. I, I finally, you know, you guys know this, but this year I'm off the emergency schedule mm-hmm. right now. First time in, since 86. Um, and that's a lot what the emergency, you know, schedule is, is soft tissue surgery. And some of the abdominal stuff is, I mean, it's great. I and mean, it's interesting surgery. Um, so focusing now, my main focus is your genital and upper airway. And I enjoy, I mean, they're, they're challenges. One thing about your general surgery is that nobody else wants to do them. You know, so that's how I ended up doing a lot of that stuff. And, and you mentioned, you know, we talked about cervixes before. That, mm-hmm. I mean, we do a lot of them here. Um, and the more you do something, the better you get. You figure out ways to, to just get a little better each year, a little better each year. And obviously that's helping the patients out. And upper airway stuff, you know, we... Uh, you know, it's nice we hired Brett Woody into our faculty who's interested in upper airway stuff. So he pushes me a bit, and I push him a little bit. And, I, I, I mean, I know I can count on him for doing that stuff. And when I, I know when I end up retiring, he's he, he's ready. I mean, he's he's guy. He's a very good surgeon. Um, so, the, again, upper airway in your general is kind of the focus now. And, and honestly, the I like doing dystocias and... I can tell you, I used to get as much of a kick out of delivering a live foal with a control vaginal delivery as about anything. I mean, you're making a difference. Yeah. You know? So, but in order to do the dystocias, I mean, you have to be willing to work at night mm-hmm. <laughs> first yeah. thing in the morning. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I finally got to the point where I, I like doing that work, but I got tired of getting up at two in the morning or four in the morning it just has to change when the mares fall yeah we yeah, could, if exactly. we could if we'd schedule those a little better yeah. that would be good yeah just between you know like yeah. nine in the morning and four in the afternoon Ralph good. would be back on that's right. exactly right yeah so tell us about upper airway surge you said that's an area of interest um what's the progression of that been uh, in the time where you've been doing surgery oh it's actually it's been great uh, when i first started doing surgery 
Well, th- so the tieback thing got developed back in the mid seventies. Is it, you know when I when I got out of veterinary school in seventy nine, so it wasn't like that was a forty year old procedure. I mean, we're you know that's still kind of been modified over the years, and mm-hmm. it's still getting modified. You know, we're trying to tweak it a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, so, you know, it, advancing the advancements in surgery. The again, the tieback is something that we're better at. Um, than we were before. And I mean, just like everything else you do, if you do a, a lot of something, you should be getting better at it. Um, the, one, the one thing that we've done here too is that um, we got pushed probably 12 to 13 years ago to have an upper airway symposium, which the surgery residents around the country would have access to, kind of like the orthopedic, the AO course that was given. And that actually, we got pushed into that a little bit by a couple old interns. Um, uh, yeah, actually, Sue Holcomb was the one that was pushing to do that. Um, and so we were able to um, talk some really good upper airway surgeons into contributing to that course. Um, and we've held it every year except the COVID thing. Last year knocked it out. Um, hopefully we can do it again this year. But um, so... Th- each year, you know, we have some very good people speaking, and it's interesting. You get all those people in one room together; they don't all do it exactly the same way. So everybody's learning from everybody still, and not just the residents who are there, but the clinicians who are there too. Um, you, know, the, the, you know, obviously Norm Ducharme is extremely well known for upper airway surgery, and he's he's really pioneered a, a, a lot of that that stuff um you know the the tie forward procedure for displacing pallets actually the person who's first author on that paper is brett woody but you know he was working at cornell with with the group up there at the time um so that that's a significant improvement for trying to treat uh displacing pallets um the, the other thing now with, you know, there was a technique in the early 90s for trying to kind of re the muscle that becomes paralyzed. Or, you know, recurrent laryngeal neuropathy is the thing we're talking about, which affects a lot of thoroughbred racehorses. And there was a technique developed, a uh, neuromuscular pedicle graft, that uh, actually a guy named Ian Fulton, he's in Australia now, but he worked on that when he was a resident at Michigan State. And we did that for a while, um, and he, he still does, I think, a fair amount of that. But... Recently, the re of the of the muscles that become paralyzed, that are, are abducting or moving the arytenoid cartilage, that's gotten tweaked some where we're just taking nerve it, itself, you know, a different nerve, and implanting it in that muscle without that muscle block that, you know, initially was started back in the 90s. So there, that was a collaboration between Ducharme out of Cornell, a guy named Fabrice Rosanal in France. Uh, there's a, a human uh, ear, nose, throat guy in France that was involved in that. So n- now there's several people around the world who are using that technique to try to re the muscles that control the, the arytenoid cartilage, or to, that abduct the arytenoid cartilage, not, not all the muscles in there. So, that, I mean, that's exciting stuff. And, and for me here in, in Lexington, since we see young thoroughbreds and it affects thoroughbreds, um, to me it's a perfect place to do it if we see it in young horses. The problem with, with you know, transplanting nerves is that for that muscle to work, uh, it, it may take 6, 8, 10, 12 months. And so, that, you know, if you have a, a racehorse that's already a 2- or 3-year-old, if you do that and you wait a year, you, you miss the money-making years, right? So to me, the trying to do that in yearlings that you know have this problem and, you know, you have some time anyway before you'd want to tie them back. The tying back young horses doesn't work as well because the cartilage isn't very strong to hold the sutures. But So we'd usually wait, you know, to do a tie back until, you know, midway through the two-year-old year anyway. So things like that. I mean, that's an exciting new kind of technique that we're working on. Um, it, we're still learning, you mm-hmm. know. So anyway. So what does a day look like for Rolf Embertson? This time of year? Oh, yeah. This time of year, it's a lot of foals. Um, 
we, you know, the everybody's trying to get everybody or get horses ready for their sales, um, since that's a lot of what's happening in Lexington, the sales work. And um, so it, actually, I look at confirmation a lot in, in young horses, foals right now, and try to figure out it can can we modify their growth a little bit at some of their joints to especially the fetlock joint and the foal um and, and see if you can make them better conformed um but hopefully they stay sound longer if if they have good confirmation and they sell better um if they have good confirmation right so that i mean right now that's a lot of what i'm doing and, and then a lot of the cleanup stuff for the year general stuff you know mares that that didn't get in foal you know, either from cervical defects or pooling, you know, urine pooling or something, um, rectovaginal fistulas that, you know, are kind of hanging on. Um, so cleaning up that kind of stuff and just getting them ready for next year uh, is a, f- a fair amount. So, so for instance, on Mondays, it's pretty much standing surgeries for me. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Friday are uh, general anesthesia, and Wednesday I do farm calls. And, and usually on farm calls, they're looking at foals or going out and checking on upper airway cases that I'd done that stayed in town. And that, that's one of the advantages of being here, too, is that a lot of these horses lay up here. So if you want to, you can go see them. And actually, from a stur- surgical standpoint, it's, it's great to be able to go see your patients and really assess how they are doing. Yeah. Not just hear about it. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's good. So I'm sure you're missing the emergency schedule. That had to be hard to come off of. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I can remember. I mean, I used to get a real kick out of doing emergencies. I mean, it was an adrenaline rush for years, which I've gotten over. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not the same anymore. But that, that, honestly, that's a bit of a younger person's game, yeah. I think. You know, I shouldn't say game, but, you know, it's just a little harder on your knees to you know, Ben, uh, do some of the stuff you have to do and your back and that kind of thing. So, mm. so with all the spare time you're going to have off the emergency schedule, yeah, what are you going to do? What's interesting, um, it so far has been filled. You know, the I still, well, you know how this goes. I mean, you, you know, you have to, people ask you to review some papers sometimes. That takes time, you know, for different journals. So you do a little bit of that. Um, it always seems like we're trying to write to submit articles for some of the um, veterinary journals. So you're kind of involved with that. Um, it, it, you know, I'm still, I mean, the elective surgery is filled in a lot of it. The one thing I can tell you, which is really nice, is that for the last couple of months, I am consistently getting six and a half, seven hours sleep a night. When you're on emergency, you know, yeah, no. you're not getting that. I mean, you might some nights, but it's not consistent, right? That that feels pretty good. <laughs> actually, actually. I've always appreciated you guys. You get that call late at night, and you go, right. Ooh, that needs to come to the hospital. Yeah. And the problem, you know, you know how it goes. I oh, mean, yeah. the problem is, is that that's the buck stops here. I mean, the, you don't. Yeah, you don't refer it. You, yeah. You know, like we aren't referring things, and that's where they, they come here for that. You know, so. Yeah, and then I do like you know I live on a farm. Obviously, I like getting on a tractor, and that sounds crazy, but I I oh, like yeah. to bow for a yeah. little bit. Those are, those are good times. Right. Also, a very accomplished family, right? The kids are the, yeah, doing as great things. R- really and, fortunate, you know. I, again, I uh, the first few years here, tr- truly, um, my my wife raised those boys. Um, they were here at the clinic a lot, you know, peering over the to see what dad was doing in the surgery room and. I remember one time um, Clara's mother asked our oldest kid what I did for a living, and <laughs> I said, "Well, he um, he arranges drapes." <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Yeah. That was that my was job. It. Was it? Yeah. You, know, you put the drapes on horses, certain, that, and then she, she said, "Well, then what does he do?" He said, "Well, he eventually takes them off." <laughs> there you go, Rolf yeah. Ibbotson, interior, de- interior <laughs> decorator. Exactly. So, so we have so from um, we have Bill Rude for for our museum. Yep. Right. We've we've got his ultrasound that's about as big as this table. We have Tom Riddle's El Camino that he practiced out of. What oh, would what would you uh, donate to the Mu- Rude and Riddle Museum? Well, if I still have it, it would be great to give him my yellow Fiesta. 
Yeah. So when I started here, you know, since Claire was pregnant, we had two cars. We had a Saab, a ni- you know, a nice, relatively new Saab, mm-hmm. and a Ford Fiesta that had about 80,000 miles on it and needed to get traded in. But, but you know, you, when you guys start out, you don't have any money, no. you know, right? So um, I was driving a, a yellow mm-hmm. Ford Fiesta for a while, and Claire had the, the Saab. Rude took me in his office one day and, and said... Um, you ever, you ever thought about a different vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> mm. So, uh, yeah, I would love to give him that. That, yeah. that would be good. Well, what he um, was practicing out of the back of a Lincoln Continental. At, no, actually, wasn't it? actually, when I started, he was practicing on the back of a Chevy Caprice. Okay. Mm. And actually, at that time, and I agreed with him, says, you don't want to have a better car than the farm manager. Yeah. And so... Um, both Tom and he were in, you know, nice cars, but they weren't fancy cars. And, I mean, for me, I couldn't afford a fancy car anyway, so that wasn't an issue. Um, so what would I give Rudd and Riddle? I have every equine or large animal North American clinics since it started back in 78. So I donate that to the library when I'm done. Okay. Uh, that's pretty huge. Oh, there's a lot of years there. Yeah, to yeah. have it to have a complete set. It's a complete that's a set. B- that's a big really? thing. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's hard to do. Yeah, I don't know. You had a mustache back then, didn't you? I've had a mustache off and on. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen a beard pictures off and on. Yeah, mustache. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well. um Again, uh, Rolf, uh, it's been great talking to you. It's been quite the journey through your life and, uh, you know, sharing your interests and your influences along the way. Yeah, thanks yeah. for joining us. It's, it's been a good yeah. time. Yeah. It's a, as you guys know, this is a great place to work. It, oh, t- it I, takes a lot of people to make it happen. I haven't, haven't got over the thrill of it. And just the changes that, that I've seen, you know, in the in the past 20 years and, and the yeah. way the thoroughbred industry works and the way practice has advanced yeah. and the mm-hmm. horses that we save now that we didn't 20, just 20 years ago. Yeah. It's, sure. it's incredible. Yeah. yeah it's true. And, and I think it's a great place to work um, because of your influence on it. And you probably don't remember when I interviewed here. But um, yeah, you Sorry. probably don't. But um, you know, time. I remember, I remember about the time. Like yeah, two thousand four. Yeah, yeah, December yeah. two thousand four. And time was getting short, and you know, I was sort of having to get taken to the plane. But I had to wait to meet Rolf Emerson. <laughs> I had to wait to meet Rolf Emerson. Even if I had to walk home, I still had to wait to meet Rolf Emerson. So it was. Uh, I think that was quite a pivotal uh, conversation. How I came to work here. Yeah. Well, and, and you're very, your, your response was very humble because y- you, this place wouldn't be what it is without you. It w- wouldn't be close. That's well, nice. You, you, you had a huge part in this. Yeah. That, that um, you definitely shaped the culture. You set the tone. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Work hard and be good to people. Yep. Yeah. Uh, th- actually, that's it. You work hard and you're good to people, and it comes back to you. It's true. Excellent. Okay. Well, again, Rolf, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. And that's uh, Stall Side. We've been talking to Dr. Rolf Imbertson. See you next time. the podcast. Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy has a relatively small marketing budget, especially when you compare us with our competitors. I understand that marketing is important, but telling people that you exist and what you do and why your products or services are different is a must. I thought about what makes us unique, and I realized I wanted to give people something of real value. That's how the podcast idea evolved. I wanted to use the money we had set aside for marketing, not to tell people who we are, but rather to show them, to open up how we do things and give something of value at the same time. Content of this podcast is designed to do exactly that. It's not going to serve as a shameless plug for pharmacy products or services. We want you to know who we are, that quality is uncompromised, that we care about people and their animals. If there are specific topics that you would like us to cover or guests that you would like to hear from, please email us at stallside at rrvp.com. Hope you enjoy the show. Just one more note, nothing that we talk about here today should be construed as veterinary advice. That's why you have a relationship with your own veterinarian. Thank you for listening.